Well, hello. Let's continue with our reading of C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce, a story about a, a bus ride from hell up to heaven, and uh, we find the various ghosts encountering what heaven is like. So let's continue. Chapter 8, it says, I sat still on a stone by the river's side, feeling as miserable as I had ever felt in my life. Hitherto, it had not occurred to me to doubt the intentions of the solid people, nor to question the essential goodness of their country, even if it were a country which I could not long inhabit. It had indeed once crossed my mind that if these solid people were as benevolent as I had heard, one or two of them claimed to be, they might have done something to help the inhabitants of the town, something more than meeting them on the plain. And now a terrible explanation came into my mind. How, if they had never meant to do us good at all, how if the whole trip were allowed the ghost merely to mock them? Horrible myths and doctrines stirred in my memory. I thought how the gods had punished Tantalus. I thought of the place in the book of Revelation where it says that the smoke of hell goes up forever in the sight of the blessed spirits. I remembered how poor Copper, dreaming that he was not after all doomed to perdition, at once knew the dream to be false and said, These are the sharpest arrows in his quiver. And what the hard-bitten ghost had said about the rain was clearly true. Even a shower of dewdrops from a branch might tear me in pieces. I had not thought of this before, and how easily I might have ventured into the spray of the waterfall. The sense of danger, which had never been entirely absent since I left the bus, awoke with sharp urgency. I gazed around on the trees, the flowers, and the talking cataract. They had begun to look unbearably sinister. Bright insects darted to and fro. If one of those were to fly into my face, would it not go right through me? If, I set, if it settled on my head, would it crush me to the earth? Terror whispered, this is no place for you. I remember also the lions. With no very clear plan in my head, I rose and began walking away from the river in the direction where the trees grew closest together. I had not fully made up my mind to go back to the bus, but I wanted to avoid open places. If only I could find a trace of evidence that it was really possible for a ghost to stay. That the choice were not only a cruel comedy. I would not go back. In the meantime, I went on gingerly and keeping a sharp lookout. In about half an hour, I came to a little clearing with some bushes in the center. As I stopped, wondering if I dared cross it, I realized that I was not alone. A ghost hobbled across the clearing as quickly as it could on an, that uneasy soil, looking over its shoulder as if it were pursued. I saw that it had been a woman, a well-dressed woman, and I thought, but its shadows of finery looked ghastly in the morning light. It was making for the bushes. It could not really get in among them. The twigs and the leaves were too hard, but it pressed as close up against them as it could. It seemed to believe it was hiding. A moment later, I heard the sound of feet, and one of the bright people came in sight. One always noticed that sound there, for we ghosts made no noise when we walked. Go away, squealed the ghost. Go away. Can't you see I want to be alone? But you need help, said the solid one. If you had at least trace of decent feeling left, said the ghost, you'll keep away. I don't want help. I want to be left alone. Do go away. You know I can't walk fast. Enough on these horrible spikes to get away from you. It's abominable of you to take advantage. Oh, that, said the spirit. That'll soon come right. But you're going in the wrong direction. It's back there to the mountains. You need to go. You can lean on me all the way. I can absolutely carry you, but you need to have almost no weight on your own feet. It will hurt less at every step. I'm afraid of being hurt. You know that? Then what's the matter? Can't you understand anything? Do you really suppose I'm going out there among all those people like this? But why not? 
I'd never come at all if I had known you were all going to be dressed like that. Friend, you see, I'm not dressed at all. I don't mean that. Do go away. But can't you even tell me? If you can't understand, there'd be no good explaining it to you. How can I go out like this among a lot of people with real solid bodies? It's far worse than going out with nothing on would have been on earth. Have everyone staring through me? Oh, I see, but we are all a bit ghostly when we first arrived. You know, that'll wear off. You just come out and try. But they'll see me. What does it matter if they do? I'd rather die. But you've died already. There's no good trying to go back to that. The ghost made a sound, something between a sob and a snarl. <laughs> I wish I'd never been born, she said. What are we born for? For infinite happiness, said the spirit. You can step out into it at any moment. But I tell you, they'll see me. An hour hence and you will not care. A day hence and you will laugh at it. Don't you remember on earth there were things too hot to touch with your finger, but you could drink them all right? Shame is like that. If you will accept it, if you will drink the cup of the, to the bottom, you will find it very nourishing. But try to do anything else with it, and it scalds. You really mean, said the ghost, and then paused. My suspense was strained up to the height. I felt that my own destiny hung on her reply. I could have fallen at her feet and begged her to yield. Yes, said the spirit, come and try. Almost, I thought, the ghost had obeyed. Certainly it had moved, but suddenly it cried out, No, I can't. I tell you I can't. For a moment while you were talking, I almost thought, but when it comes to the point, you've no right to ask me to do a thing like that. It's disgusting. I should never forgive myself if I did. Never, never. It's not fair. They ought to have warned us. I'd never have come. And now, please, please go away. Friend, said the spirit, could you only for a moment fix your mind on something not yourself? I've already given you my answer, said the ghost, coldly but still tearful. Then only one expedient uh, remains, said the spirit, and to my great surprise, he set a horn to his lips and blew. I put my hands over my ears. The earth seemed to shake. The whole wood trembled and dindled at the sound. I suppose there must have been a pause after that, though there seemed to be none, before I heard the thudding of hooves. Far off at first, but already nearer before I had well identified it, and soon so near that I began to look about for some place for safety, but I had found one danger was all that I had found one the danger was all about us. I heard a herd of unicorns came thundering through the glades, 27 hands high, the smallest of them, and white as swans, but for the red gleam in the eyes and the nostrils and the flashing indigo of their horns, I can still remember the squelching noise of the soft, wet turf under their hooves, the breaking of the undergrowth, the snorting and the whinnyings, how their hind legs went up and their horned heads down in mimic battle, even then I wondered for what real battle it might be the rehearsal. I heard the ghost scream, Aah! and I think it made a bolt away from the bushes, perhaps toward the spirit, but I don't know. For my own nerve failed and I fled, not heeding for the moment the horrible going on underfoot, and not once daring to pause, so I never saw the end of that interview. And that's the end of chapter 8.